So we have with us today again uh, Professor Jim Crotty, Emeritus Professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and an expert on financial markets, financial theory, the economic crisis. Thanks, Jim, for being with us. You're welcome. So we have this big financial crisis that we haven't yet seen the end of. And um, the question is, what kind of economic, economic theory is there out there uh, that can help us understand how we got into this mess and how we might get out of it? Well, uh, essentially, we could say uh, something which would be a little bit too simple, but it's not too far from the truth. There are two kinds of theories about how financial markets work. One kind is the standard mainstream uh, financial economist theory, um, which is sometimes re referred to as efficient markets theory, um, which uh, argues that um, the right way to understand financial markets and the right way, therefore, to understand uh, regulation, uh, to, to, the way to inform regulation, is to use a theory based on the idea that uh, people actually know uh, what the future uh, values and, and yields on economic security, financial securities are. So uh, the theory begins with the assumption that people know the future. Uh, at least they know um, the kind of statistical distributions that will generate the actual profits and cash flows and interest flows of bonds. And that uh, they, they then can uh, use these, this information to calculate a, port, uh, a desired portfolio of securities for themselves, um, which will optimally balance risk and return. So they can get the risk, they can get the return that they need at the minimum risk or can get the minimum return at the max, minimum risk at the maximum return. And it's an equilibrium model which means it's a picture of an economy or a set of financial markets sitting uh, uh, without movement. It's just in this ideal uh, situation where everything's priced just right, the prices reflect the actual risk, everyone has an optimal portfolio, no one is confused, and no one, everything is uh, clear, um, no one is taking risks that they are not uh, aware of, and nothing can happen. I, I stress the fact that it's equilibrium because it means it's not a dynamic model. It isn't something which says that, well, we're here for this instant, but there'll be decisions coming in response to where we are, which will change where we are. Um, there are many variants of that, but that's the main picture that, uh, that the profession uh, presents and has presented to, to government regulators uh, over decades, which has helped government regulators decide that with such a beautiful and perfect uh, set of financial markets, there's no reason for the government to regulate very much. And they didn't. There's an alternative view, which is almost kind of the inverse view, um, which looks at financial markets as an ongoing historical dynamic process with its own, its own internal sources of motion and change. Um, this theory, is these, there's many of these theories, that the ones that people that are most commonly associated with are John Maynard Keynes, um, and then in a modern follower of Keynes, whose uh, name was uh, Hyman Minsky, uh, although it's also the case that, uh, that the general ideas that they have about financial markets were similar to the uh, ideas that Karl Marx had about uh, financial markets. So, their ideas are the following. Uh, nobody knows the future. The future is absolutely unknowable. Uh, Keynes referred to it as uncertain or fundamentally uncertain. Um, so the entry point for this theory is the exact opposite of the entry point for the efficient markets theory, is that no one can know the future because the future is not yet determined. I if you think about the efficient markets theory, the only way that people could know the correct future cash flows coming off securities was just if the future already existed or at least was already determined. But the future isn't determined. We have to make decisions now in the light of ignorance of what's going to happen in the future, which will then influence what happens in the economy, who invests, uh, you know, what new technologies come up, you know, how wealth is distributed, and so on and so forth. And these will then affect the future. They'll, de they'll, they'll determine the future path. So once you assume that people can't know the future but have to make decisions about financial markets and investment and other things, 
um, in, in spite of the fact that they don't have uh, ignorance of the future, you get this system which kind of, at any point in time, people are, have to kind of guess what's going to happen in the future, make decisions based on this. This will move the economy forward. It will change the economy, which means people will have to make new guesses uh, and, and so on. So this kind of dynamic system in motion um, is uh, associated with the ideas of Keynes, Minsky, and so forth. Um, so the idea basically is here, okay, we don't know the future. People don't know the future. Um, in order to make decisions about anything, including what to do in financial markets, they have to make forecasts or, ex or extrapolation or guesses or, or uh, form expectations about the uncertain future. Um, they don't know how to do that, so there's no way to do that perfectly, so they use heuristics, just conventions about how to do this. So the main convention which is stressed by these guys, which, is the, which makes tremendous sense, is that unless there's good reason not to do this, people tend to kind of just extrapolate where we've been recently to where we're going to go. So if the stock market has been kind of drifting upward for a while, people will begin to assume the most likely guess, it's not the truth, but the most likely guess is that it's going to continue to drift up. Um, so if, if the stock market or other financial markets are in fact drifting up for a while, people will b begin to build that into their expectations formation or forecasting mechanism. So if the, the, the relevant past has been a pretty optimistic, it's been a pretty uh, good path for securities, they'll begin to project that it will continue to be a good path. Now, because this is all just guesses, and it, this is a psychological activity, not an engineering or mathematical activity, people are also have to assess not only where they think the markets are going. Is the stock market going to go up? Is it going to go up by 5% next year, 10%? They have to ask themselves, how confident am I that my forecast is going to actually be true? So. Um, if I think the market is going to go up by 10% next year, but I'm not so sure about that, I'll be hesitant to be too aggressive in buying stocks. I'll be hesitant about borrowing too much money to buy stocks. But if you have a bubble developing, a, you know, a kind of a financial upswing developing, um, and people's forecasts become more optimistic, but not only that, their confidence that the forecasts are right will increase. So you begin to think not only is the stock market likely to go up, but I'm, I'm more and more sure that that's the truth. And therefore, I definitely want to buy stocks. And I, maybe I want to go to my broker and say I want to borrow to buy stock. So there's a process which is kind of reasonable and seems reasonable uh, in which um, people begin to become more optimistic as the boom proceeds and they begin to become more confident in their optimism as the boom proceeds. They begin to borrow more money to buy stocks as the boom proceeds. Uh, the people who are most aggressive and most confident in whatever in the market will be the people who make the most money. They'll be making a lot of money. Money will be raining down on these people. And other people will look, it's a psychological process and social process, and they'll, they'll begin to want to emulate them. Like, you know, uh, if you're married, you'll go home and you tell your partner that you've been cautious in the market, you know, and you're trying to, you know, watch out, and, she'll, and she or he will say, uh, well, our next door neighbor has been pretty aggressive in the market, and they've got a new car and a new vacation home, and, and you know, and they're doing great, and what are we doing? So why is this a problem? Why doesn't this just lead to perpetual prosperity? Um, because, to be and because, well, according to anybody sane, um, uh, we have certain limitations on the actual growth of the economic system and the growth of the, the goods and services that people, can, that, that, that people can get command over. So the financial markets can grow 5% a year, 10% a year, 15% a year, 20% a year. From 1995 to 2000, the stock market grew 25% a year, annually. I suppose that's what happens every year. It's annual. Um, uh, the economy can't grow 25% a year. The economy, at best, can grow 3%, 4% a year on average. So at some point, the, the, the projection and the expectations get kind of disconnected from the ability of the economic system to deliver. 
And, and, and that will then show up. It will turn out that corporations can't make that many, much profit. It will turn out that uh, workers can't make the wages that are required to buy the products that would require the economy to keep moving. It would turn out that the technological innovations which were supposed to be able to raise double productivity actually can only increase it by 5%. This clash comes up. Minsky's term is the financial system gets increasingly financially fragile, which means it, it increasingly people are committing their expected cash flows, their wages and profits and so forth, to financial assets. Um, and that anything that goes wrong in the economy which can upset these cash flows, right? Reduce profits, reduce, you know, lower jobs, lower wages, lower household incomes and whatever, will then smack people in the face and say, our expectations were unrealistic. Now, and, and, and we get a reverse. Now, people say that this current crisis was caused by too much leverage, too much borrowing. Is this somehow connected with that process? And what do it it, it, it is connected with that process, although, quite frankly, I think Cain, both Keynes and Minsky, uh, Keynes writing, uh, you know, in in uh, from the the early 1900s and died in 1946, and Minsky I think died in 19, 1990 or something like that. So uh, their models are mostly about the financial system kind of getting pumping up and pumping up around an investment and growth process that can't follow. And that sooner or later, this this mismatch is discovered, and uh, people then say, "Oh my God, uh, the profits can't be high enough. My stocks are overpriced. Let me sell." And then everyone wants to sell uh, before everyone else sells. Otherwise, they won't get you know their, their money back. They they only get ninety percent or eighty percent or seventy percent, and we get this financial collapse, which then pulls the real sector down. Um, in this case. Uh, the, tr the triggers were mostly about um, securities, I I innovative securities, complicated innovative securities that the financial markets had created, so-called uh, asset-backed securities that uh, based on, the most importantly, based on mortgages. Um, and then we had all these, these financial innovations, uh, uh, asset mortgage-backed securities, things called collateralized debt obligations, and then things caused collateralized debt obligations squared and, and, and synthetic collateralized debt obligations and all these multiples of complicated house of cards built on mortgage flows and house prices. And uh, in the process of the, of the financial markets, the firms um, buying all these mortgages, securitizing them, selling them off to other financial firms who then sold them off to other financial firms. Uh, we, we had this huge uh, development, this tremendous explosion of inter-financial market debt. So we got financial markets became increasingly indebted. The numbers, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but something like in you know, 1980 or whatever, financial market debt was 20% of GDP, and by, by we, we entered the 2000s, and it's 100 or 120% of GDP. So. The financial market indebtedness was a big part of this problem because partly of these Keynesian, Minsky ideas about the endogenous movements and people becoming more confident and becoming more optimistic, and partly because of the particular compensation, bonus-based compensation system, which incentivized all these guys making these decisions in financial markets to take on more and more risk and more and more debt and more and more short-term debt. Um, we got, we got the, the, the vulnerable point, the real fragile point, was within financial markets themselves. And, and the crisis was triggered fundamentally by the, uh, the unpredicted, uh, at least by the financial market players, uh, uh, end of the housing price bubble, uh, and then the exposure of the vulnerability of many of the mortgages that were written, particularly towards the 2006-2007, um, people were, the financial firms were giving mortgages to people who could possibly pay them back because they needed the mortgages to get into asset-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations because that's what making all the bonuses. So, so that whole thing collapsed. So it was, the, the, what triggered the, the economic crisis was the, the, was the housing market uh, which had been used as a kind of the basis of a pyramid of, of uh, financial market gambling. 
Now, many politicians and economists have said that nobody could have foreseen the crisis, <laughs> and um, that if we just have better information about um, about what's going on in the economy, that we can forestall a, a future crisis. Well, I I, I want to know what, what uh, you and and Keynes and Minsky would would say about this. Um, I would agree that if we had better information about the future, uh, some of these problems would go away. Um, but since we can't have we, information about the future at all, that's not, that's not going to help us. Um, uh, first of all, it isn't true that nobody foresaw the, the, the crisis. There was a, a fairly widespread set of people uh, in, in the college and university community, in the financial community, um, uh, who, who's looked at this thing and said, you know, this is getting riskier and riskier and riskier. Every index of risk that we can see is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the, I remember reading reports by the Bank of England during this period, which saying, "Oh my God, look at look at the debt that's that the, that the large banks are are generating, and look at how how huge their responsibilities, their liabilities are getting, uh, and 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 look at how many liabilities are hidden in complicated accounting." phenomena called special investment vehicles and so on, which are kind of off their balance sheets. There, there's even more risk hidden there. Um, and look how much, how, how the investment banks and others are buying these big, complicated, debt-loaded securities like collateralized debt obligations, which um, have no market. They're so complicated, they just occasionally traded from one firm to another. There's no market for them. Nobody knows what's in them. They're not transparent, whatever. And they're, and they're long-term, 30-year, you know, security. You don't get your money back until 30 years from now. And the investment banks are borrowing half of their money overnight to buy these securities. So if anything starts to go wrong with the securities, half of their assets, half of the money that they have to buy can leave overnight. So lots of people saw this. Uh, number one. Number two, anyone who has any, even a cursory knowledge of the history of capitalist financial markets knows that always and ever, at all times, in all uh, centuries, under all institutional structures, the markets go up and the markets come down. There's no such thing as, as, as you know, markets that aren't subject to these problems. So um, the first thing is that lots of people foresaw this if I may say so. I foresaw this. Um, but lots of more important people than I uh, saw this. Lots of insiders saw this. Secondly, uh, you have to be almost a religious fanatic about efficient markets theory to, to look at history and say, history's gone now, not last time, not in the 1990s, not in the 1980s, not in the 1930s, not in the, you know, but now all of these pressures that always produce bubbles have disappeared. Or you have to have, a, to be heavily incentivized with tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to pretend that you don't see it. So lots of insiders saw this thing. Um, I'll bet lots of people in the regulatory apparatus kind of saw this thing, but nobody wanted to do anything about it. Nobody was incentivized, including the regulators, to do anything about it. Thank you very much. You're welcome.